Thanks. Um, guess that's it. Well, you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, good evening. Um, we expected tonight to be a smaller group with it being holiday weekend, and it is not. Um, so welcome. We're glad you're with us tonight. Um, we are talking tonight about shame. Uh, last weekend, I was hosting a women's B12 trauma retreat. Luke came and spoke and he talked a little bit about shame. And um, one of the women came up after and she said, you know, it'd be really helpful is if you two gave like a, a role play of what shame can sound like and then what it sounds like when you're working through shame. And I was like, oh, that's really good. And so we kind of put together um, a little bit on shame. And if you've never attended one of these before, we kind of have a really rough outline where we share um, a mini lesson or a tool, and that takes however long it takes. And then after that, we open it up to Q&A. So we're going to talk first about shame and why it's important to recovery and why it's really important to understand for both sides, um, the person who has betrayed and the person who has been betrayed. Um, so Brene Brown talks about shame real quick please jump right into it when you told me that one of the women at the conference said that they wanted us to do a role play i had to deal with my own shame spiral in that moment <laughs> thinking about like us role playing in front of a large group of people and making sure we got this right so if i can go back to that mindset i think we'll be just fine so uh, yeah i'm actually having people say that it's hard to hear me still I'm not is sure. it still hard to hear yeah, that's what, that's what somebody else said. Okay, maybe you should fix your audio before we get too far into it then. Oh, is that better? Or is that the same thing? I think it sounds better, uh, but those who are listening, will someone jump in and tell us? Oh, okay, they said it's good. Okay, good. All right, cool. Thank you for putting <laughs> that in the chat. Didn't know how I was going to fix that if that didn't work. Good, 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 good. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know. Um, okay. So Brene Brown, if you haven't heard of her, she is a researcher that she, um, specializes in studying shame. And when she started out, she, um, multiple people said, this will be the death of your career. Do not do this. Do not study this. Do not waste your energy. And, um, it actually has been massively huge in her career. And it has been huge for all who study her work because we all experience shame. So her definition of shame is shame is an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. So she differentiates it between shame says I'm bad. When I make a mistake, when I get embarrassed, when I do something wrong, shame says I'm bad. Guilt says I did something bad. So she differentiates between the two of those. But again, it's an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we're flawed, we're not perfect, and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. So it's an emotion that affects all of us and it affects how we interact with the world. And it's interesting because she runs a course or used to, I don't think she does it anymore, but she had a course and it was called a shame resiliency course. And the goal wasn't to get rid of the shame. The goal was to learn where is my shame showing up and how to work through the shame because having levels of shame is a very human experience. We all have levels of shame. And so um, Luke, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about shame spirals, but it is really easy if we haven't studied shame or done our work around shame, it is really easy to get caught in what is called a shame spiral, where our shame kind of takes over and hijacks, maybe that's a good word, hijacks us emotionally. And can I talk a little bit about where we work on shame, where we become shame resilient Alana for a moment yeah okay so uh, what I'm thinking about is is when a man starts first working in his journey um there's you know uh addiction and shame go hand in hand secrecy lying 
not wanting to be, if, if I show up and show you who I really am, you won't accept me. And I love that you just teed it up for us a lot of it. It's about acceptance. We experience shame because we're, it's out of fear that we won't be accepted. And the, a man will reach out to me and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this life. What do I do? I want to fix it. And I say, okay, well, there's usually a three-legged stool, which is depending on how deep you are into the mire and how long you've been struggling with this. Uh, find a really good one-on-one -on -one coach or a therapist, find a group and find somebody that you can connect with. Um, and somebody that you can talk to that's been through the journey, uh, that's on the other end of it. And that group piece is, is how to become more, uh, is, is on how to become shame resilient. That they show up with a group of men and they go, oh wow, I'm telling them I'm ugly and they still accept me. The interesting thing is, is if you take a look at men of Moroni, um, or the, a group of men of Moroni or Choose 180, the, are the two courses I work with with men is they actually do some really beautiful amazing work around becoming shame resilient but the problem is is it's usually not well with men in Moroni it's usually not around their spouse it's around other men it's around other humans but they don't become shame, very shame resilient around their spouse so much so they they learn that they're okay but it can really bubble up when they start to interact with their spouse Okay, so I uh, just want to say that I want to go with great um, to go on the shame spiral. <laughs> no, I, I want to build on that. Okay. Um, I, I like that you brought up um, shame with the spouse because of anywhere that shame can get triggered the most is with your significant other. Um, going back to that definition where if we believe that we are flawed and therefore, and this is usually subconscious, that we're flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Well, if our spouse becomes our primary attachment, like of all people in the world, we want the loving and belonging from that person the most. And so in essence, your significant other can emotionally feel like the most dangerous person in this world to you because you want and need that love and belonging from them more than anyone else in the world. And it goes back and if you've heard past ones, I go into attachment probably at least once every time. Um, why? But there's just very basic um, parts of your brain that are hooked to attachment that's also hooked to survival. And so it is a very neurobiological um, component of needing the other person or wanting the other person to love and accept you. I'm not going to go into all that tonight. but. Um, so your significant other, them, um, feeling shame around them can come up the most, or you can get triggered the most. And so we need to recognize that because when we have a relationship that has betrayal in it, where we have this deep attachment injury in it, we are going to have so many shame triggers come up, especially when one person has made choices that have damaged the relationship. And so for the person who has acted out, the shame spirals are very, very common. And shame needs three main things to really thrive. It's secrecy, silence, and judgment. And a lot of times when we have either a sexual addiction or sexual acting out, there's tons of secrecy. And usually that secrecy has started like all the way back in childhood or in younger years. Silence, if, especially when we have cultures that we don't talk about this. We don't talk about sexuality. We don't talk about porn. We don't talk about masturbation, fill in the blank. When we have a culture of secrecy or silence, we're going to have so much more shame. And then judgment. Judgment can come family judgment, um, judgment from religious cultures, judgment from um, just society, judgment from your significant other. So shame really thrives with secrecy, silence, and judgment. Um, so I just think that's a good kind of foundation to go into before we talk about the shame spiral. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all right. So do we want to do the scenario, Alana? Uh, can you describe what a, what a shame spiral kind of is? And then we can do our scenario. Yeah, spiral. Um, uh, for those of you who've been in uh, 180, um, we totally learned the ETEP tool, which is basically there's a trigger, thoughts and emotions which lead to behavior. Uh, what 
all of our, all that happens that our spouse sees is um, when we have a spiral is three different things. Um, fight, flight, or freeze. Okay. So the outcome of a shame spiral is again, fight, flight, or freeze. Again, the behavior is, is I'm going to wall off. Uh, I'm going to run away or I'm going to, I'm going to attack you. And men typically experience um, the same thing over and over again. You have fighters or you have freezers, uh, men that are just wall off. Um, not probably less of the run away. It um, doesn't have to be that way. So what shame spirals look like is there's always a trigger, okay? There's a trigger, which is, you know, your wife says, uh, a, a spouse says something, and then immediately in that moment, because of shame, there's it's a lot of self-judgment that happens, a lot of, oh my goodness, these things that she's saying is, is I'm a piece of crap, like, man, I've just done these things, this hasn't been okay, like, uh, I'm just the worst person ever. And then there's, you know, going quiet, the pulling away. And what I'll notice is the spiral happens is a lot of times when it comes from a going quiet standpoint, the brain goes like uh, emotions and the feelings inside the body is some blackness, some gray, some just, it's almost like quicksand to a certain point, really ability to be able to move. And then what will happen is, is the man often will want, will have heard if he's been around for a bit to stay present with the spouse, hold space, but he just, the spiral is, is because the self-judgment uh, and that those feelings, that black and gray feelings just kind of consume him just like that quicksand and he can't stay present or he doesn't feel like he can stay present. And then there's the more, the more she, she responds, um, she'll seek in her moment whatever he's saying, the more that she talks, the more he shuts down, the more she actually says it. And it just picture like a, just that spiral, uh, that quicksand or that whatever it might be. And then after that experience is, is he tries to find some type of way to feel better because he can't deal with that shame anymore. And there's a lot of numbing out behavior. There's a lot of anything to avoid discomfort. So getting away from her and then which can really the outcomes get worse at that point. Uh, and then there's more shame and, and self judgment from uh, from increased behavior when I mean, he notices he's walling off and he doesn't like it and where she's like, why don't you talk to me. Uh, and then that also can lead to some resentment towards her, it can lead to some uh, him starting to self protect when he was becoming quiet at first to going, viewing it as, as her problem, or, you know, this, that piece that he can't have, or that what he can't give her, eventually turns into what he's doing, and starts to put that on her. Alana, you want to comment on that? I have a question. Um, yeah. So where my brain goes, if I were listening to this before I knew everything that I know today, I would have been like, okay, okay, so shame needs secrecy, silence, and judgment, then if I see Luke go into a shame spiral, I need to make sure I'm not judging him and I need to help him and encourage him and, um, and really like be there and make sure he feels like he belongs and make sure he's worthy. I would have gone into like hyper overdrive of like, how do I fix your shame? So can a spouse fix their partner's shame? Uh, it's kind of like jumping into quicksand with them, um, you know, trying to just like jump in there and push them out of it. Uh, no, um, their responsibility is not to fix their partner's shame. Um, there might, they might have had some level of success with attempting to fix the other person's shame, um, but that's not for the spouse to jump in there and try to fix and pull them out of it. Uh, you know, there's, if, if there is some type of fixing that can happen where they go, no, you are good enough. And I've seen this happen a lot. The wife says, no, you're a good guy. Like you just, you're just making bad choices. You're a good guy. Uh, if he believes that it can only be for a moment, but when he's back by himself or when she's having any response that isn't just completely positive, then he can sink back into that. Well, you know, that, that shame spiral. Uh, and really we'll talk about shame resilience here in a second, but what this looks like is, um, 
this can only be provided for oneself. This can only be given a gift, only given oneself as they understand where the shame is coming from and what it's about. Well, it's interesting because it makes me think about, okay, when I am struggling with my self-esteem, like if I look in the mirror and I decide I don't like the way that I look, no matter how much you are like, you look beautiful. This is this try to compliment me. If that's not something that I'm doing my own work on, or I believe then your words really, they don't stay with me. They don't carry because I myself at the deep core would feel unworthy. So you can't give that to me. That's something I really have to do my own work around is my own self-esteem and my own self-love. So I can hear other people's words and take those in, but then I can also give that to myself. And so it's similar with shame that while I can support my partner through them having difficult shame, if I'm in a place that I have the capacity to, a lot of times when a woman is going through her own trauma, she does not have the capacity or the space to hold that for them, nor should she. Her responsibility or his responsibility, the partner who's been betrayed, their responsibility is really to focus on their own healing and to step out of that role of trying to do it. And I, and I look back kind of where I went of like, I would have been like, super, I got to help him. I got to fix him. I was so hyper-focused on helping you and fixing you for so many years that I completely lost myself. I couldn't do my own work or move forward because I was hyper-focused on yours. And the reality is, is I was getting in the way of you being able to do your own work. I was blocking you and trying to always save and rescue you which didn't give room for you to really figure out the things that you needed to do to stand on your own two feet. Yeah. You say, you say me all the time, you know, you were always working to make me feel better. I remember my worst days and we're taught this, right? Right. If you're, you know, Christian heavens, it's um, when somebody else is having a hard day, we get in a hole with them. Right. But along often was trying to push me out of the hole and, there was something that my therapist said that I really, really, really hated. And it's kind of triggering within itself. Um, he said, you know, Luke, you're here. And, you know, um, he just basically said, if, you know, if your God, your kids, your wife, if they were enough, you wouldn't be here. And what he was trying to say was, is you ultimately have to like you and you ultimately have to believe in you and feel like you're worth it and you're worthy enough out uh and then that will be sustainable long term for you to be able to deal with what other people throw your way or what be able to connect with other people but uh i i didn't like me and i had so many issues with my behavior and what i was doing um because of what i learned that it was really toxic in 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 and of itself well patrick carnes who um is kind of the the founder of all of the work around sex addiction. And, and I know not everyone here qualifies under the umbrella of sex addiction. We have other types of acting out that are not sex addiction. But um, what I have seen collectively around um, a lot of sexual acting out behaviors, this applies to, as he said, one of the four faulty core beliefs of an addict is if they really knew me, they couldn't love me. Like if they really knew me, And that right there, that speaks to the shame. They really knew all of my thoughts. If they really knew everything I had done, if they really knew who I really was, they couldn't love me. And so that right there, that shame, that as an individual has to be worked through. And and two ways, and we'll get into our scenario, I promise. But two ways I think that are really important in doing this work, because you hear us say, like, you got to do the work, you got to do the work. And then people will say, Alana, what the heck do you mean by like, do your work? Well, doing the work is, we'll give you step by step in a minute, but I really think that happens when you're in a group, because as part of a group, you are um, taking your shame and you're taking all of that secrecy and silence. And you are showing up real and authentic. So group work and working one-on-one with a coach or a therapist are going to be two big ways that really help you work through the shame. The shame work is an essential piece of recovery. Sobriety is one piece. 
recovery, we got to tackle the shame because here's the number one reason why I want you to tackle the shame. Shame blocks empathy. The antidote to shame is empathy for ourselves and for other people, but shame blocks empathy. So if you have a partner that you've hurt and you're going, how do I build trust? How do I repair this relationship? We can't do it without empathy, but we can't have empathy when our shame keeps showing up and getting in the way. So this is why this is so important. Yeah, well said. And that is so just does not make sense. The, um, the after I've gone through my experience of having my wife having her trigger, the self-compassion and empathy is something that is going to be part of it for not just her, but also for myself and my feelings that I'm having. Yeah. So let's do our scenario and then we'll give uh, the example of what the shame spiral looked like in the scenario and then what shame resilience looks like. And this scenario is a real one um, that Luke and I experienced because I feel like when we can show up with this really happened, it uh, it's usually pretty relatable to other people because we have walked through hell with all of this. So do you want me to set it up? Please. Okay, so uh, Alana, Alana and I live in Las Vegas. So we are, um, it was date night, some, it was date night or whatever. We went to get some food. We were walking through a building and there was a sign that read um, uh, NFR Rodeo um, coming to town, such and such a date. And Alana said this. Is that my cue? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I saw the sign and I went, oh! I want to go to the rodeo. And I said that out loud. And the minute those words came out of my mouth, instantly, I had this just barrage of images of what the women would be dressed like at the rodeo. I pictured cowboy hats and short shorts and it's Vegas and it's hot. And I just, all of a sudden I went from pure excitement to, I just went from zero to a hundred, super triggered super upset, super, um, oh, angry. I was angry at him. And I turned to him and I said something along the lines of you have taken everything from me. I can't even go to like events. I want to go to, I will never again be able to live my life. You have literally stolen everything from me. And so Luke's literally walking by my side. We're having a good time. And he watches me go from pure excitement to my bodyguard coming out to anger and judgment. And how dare you in a second? Yeah. So I'm going from my wife being a really warm, fuzzy person to a prickly pear cactus in the moment. And I'm totally feeling this like, oh, we were having such a really nice night together. And now it's shocked and it is not going to get better. Like, and as we're walking side by side, I notice myself kind of like start to, to like notice my body, like respond to the situation. Like I kind of start, I want to move away from her. Like I want to actually, instead of walking side by side with her, I want to create space and distance. And my brain is racing for, um, again, this is a shame spiral. My brain is racing for key phrases and words and things to say to make it better to get the situation to go away, um, which I'm not finding, you know, which I'm, I'm not. So brain's going a million miles a minute. There's certain words going through my head. Um, and it is, you know, some words like this, you know, this is, this is your life. There's nothing that is going to be enjoyable without her being triggered and, and, and being, in a place where I am the enemy. Uh, very few things we can do together. Okay, so um, now the rest of the shame spiral, what it would look like is as we go, now we're walking and we're going to get in the car, right? And we open up the doors to the car, we get in our car, parking garage, and there is more of what I just phrased. There's more of, more of, more of what I just said. Uh, which is noticing Alana, watching everything that's happening about her. When is she going to warm up? Is she softening up yet? You know, can I jump in here? Uh, how bad is this going to be? 
uh, you know, can I change the subject? Can I talk about something else? And I point out everything he's describing, none of it is about my pain or my trigger and what's happening to me, right? Mm -hmm. Because the shame is taking over. So shame is like the trigger hits, self-judgment kicks in, pulling away, going quiet, spinning in the head, not being able to stay present. Like it's all about him and that spinning, just spin, 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 spin. And at the, that exact t- same time, here I am. And I'm like, he's going quiet. He's shutting down. Like, what the heck? Can't you just apologize? Can't you say something? Can't you address what just happened? And so I'm spinning in my anger and frustration and he's spinning in his silence and his shame. And the two of us really are just going further and further and further downhill. And what I'll notice about Alana and I, which recognize this won't happen to every couple, is she engages in talking and I am waiting to see what I can say to fit in. And when she engages and I don't show up, then she becomes more focused on getting me to respond. And I become, I view her as very intense, very much like she's very much the enemy at this point. She's very much. Well, I am very intense. Yeah. <laughs> like I will fully own when I am triggered. I am very intense as I imagine a lot of you, a lot of you do. Like when you get triggered, when you've had this type of trauma, you go into a fight, flight, or freeze. That's a survival mechanism that you're not actively choosing, but your body is responding to. So yeah, it it will look and feel very intense. So I'm this whole time going, dude, you deserve this. Like this would be nice to not be here, but you absolutely deserve her saying anything that she's going to say, because you did cause all this. This is your fault. This is your problem. Think of that in my head. And then we go, I don't know, a couple hours into our night, Alana, I would say. And then um, what's happening in my head is, is what has been shame spiral, okay? What has maybe been taken from me, which is like, you know, I can't believe another date night was ruined. Um, probably not going to have in, any intimacy tonight. Uh, probably, you know, who knows how this is going to affect the next day. More woe is me, more this is tough. Um, and then there's slowly starts to build over the next, depending on what happens, resentment, um, some type of resentment from not being able to talk about things like, you know, how the fact that things are getting better, it seems to be getting better, or I'm showing up, I'm not lashing out. Like I could be lashing out. I could be saying things. And me being quiet isn't, or me not saying mean things isn't being celebrated version of that. And it's, it, the shame spiral doesn't last for a few moments. It can last for a longer period of time. Yeah. I am glad that you said that because that shame spiral can last for days or weeks or months, or if we never learn to do our work, we'll stay in it for years or a lifetime. And so, um, going back to kind of where we started around can I, can I build on one more thing a lot before we go on? Yeah. Okay. So what I'll notice is, is this is, this is the where it becomes really, really toxic, the shame spiral. Very, very, is we have something that changes the pattern, changes the, changes the evening or changes the next day where Alon and I start to kind of warm up to each other. Not because of, not because we actually dealt with the problem of the shame or dealt with the situation, but because maybe, I don't know, we had something to Something good happened, like, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of random things. Kids are doing good in something. Yeah, something else distract us and we have a way to. Yeah, and we connect a little bit, but it's not, it's not, it's not that connecting on the tough thing that happened. It's connection in another way. So what I do is, is I go, part of my shame spiral is, is the distraction of like, okay, everything's okay now. She's okay with me. She likes me. We're all right. But, what but happened, we never actually dealt with it. We never actually dealt with it. So a lot of pushing down, a lot of now suppressed it. So the next time it happens, which is going to happen sooner rather than later, everything comes back up again. It rears its ugly head, but it, it just is intense or more intense than the last time. Um, okay, that's all I wanted yeah. to say. No, I'm, I'm glad you added that piece. And so what I want to do is kind of go back 
to when we started, we said that um, what you can do so you don't get in the shame spiral is you can learn how to build shame resilience. And going back to Brene Brown, she said that men and women who, ha who have high levels of shame resilience are able to acknowledge and move through their shame. So that's what the shame resilience is. They can acknowledge and move through the shame. And she said, but those people, they have four main things in common. They, one, they know their shame triggers. So they know what it looks like and what it feels like to have their shame triggered. And the reality is, is most people don't. Most people get triggered and they don't recognize the anger they're feeling is their shame is triggered or their embarrassment or their frustration or their pulling away and going quiet. They don't recognize those as being triggers of their shame. So shame resilient people know their shame triggers. Do you want to add anything to that, Luke, real quick? No. Mm -hmm. They are able to um, reality check around their shame, which means they basically can go, okay, what is actually happening? Is this something that I need to feel guilt about or embarrassment about? Is this somebody actually rejecting me? They can just reality check what's happening. They learn how to share their story. Oh, with oh, oh. That, can I, I gotta, can we stop and just talk about that part? <laughs> sure. Knowing whether somebody's actually rejecting me or not. So often men think that their wife is rejecting them when they're looking for connection. In that moment, my wife was not rejecting me, but it felt like I was being rejected. She was actually looking for connection. Mm. Um, a thousand percent. In that moment, when I had that trigger, A, I didn't want to be in pain. I didn't want our night ruined. I didn't want, like I wanted to go do fun things with him. But I really like more than anything in that moment, that was, that was fear that really kicked up for me. And it was fear and pain. And in that moment, I desperately wanted Luke to see my fear and my pain and let me know it was going to be okay. Let me know that he saw me and he got it. And, and I wanted empathy. I wanted empathy in that moment. And the, and the reality was, is at that time when this all happened, he wasn't capable of it, not yet, because he hadn't done that, this work to be able to build that muscle. And I'm hearing a lot of pain in the chat, the private chat, another one around husbands yet not having that uh, stamina yet. And uh, my heart goes out to both of you, because I'm, I'm going to make an assumption, which isn't a very cool, I'm going to make it an assumption that... Um, it makes sense why she wants it. And it makes sense why he wants to do it, but is struggling to do it. Yeah. So I think it's good to just insert here really quick. Um, I say really quick, we're at 37 minutes. I know. Um, this was going to be a short one, but I feel like this one's so important. We're going to take as long as we need to take, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that if you've never done any of this type of work before, you're going to be starting at like elementary level. One plus one equals two, two plus two equals four. We're on like kindergarten, first grade math here. And Luke and I have been doing this enough that maybe we're now doing some statistics or trigonometry. And, but if you're at the beginning of this, you have to learn piece by piece. So in the beginning, it usually does look messy as you're trying to tackle your shame and learn how to work through it and learn how to be resilient through it. And I wanted Luke to hear something like this and then go figure it out and start doing it tomorrow. I wanted that because I so badly wanted a partner who could be there with me and who could be empathetic. But the reality is, is this type of work did take years of consistent effort. And I wish it were faster. Yeah, and the, book, the book by the book about shame was called, I thought it was just me. Oh, there's she, all of her books cover all of her it. books are on shame. Yeah. She, I want to say she's at like nine books now, but she has um, a four hour audio called, you can only listen to it, but it's called men, women, and worthiness. It's only four hours. So I like that. That's a good one to start with where she talks about empathy and shame. Um, 
but yeah, power of vulnerability talks about shame, um, all of her books. Yeah. So can we, can we jump into the shame resilience part? Or yeah. I know you kind of already are, but can we give the example of what that would be? Uh, let me just get through the four things they are. Okay. Um, so the four things that they are is, you know, your shame triggers, you learn how to reality check around your shame. You learn how to share your story with safe people and you learn how to speak your shame, which I just want to like highlight that these feel very counterintuitive when you start. Like when, when you have shame, everything in you says, shut down, be quiet, be secretive. We have tons of self-judgment. And so we have to learn to start talking to ourselves like someone we love. Like when, when you have a child who's feeling really unworthy, you're not going to be like, well, screwed that up again, idiot. Like, why'd you do that? It's not how you're going to talk to your child. And so we have to learn for ourselves to start having self-compassion. And yes, the person who has betrayed it is essential, essential for them to learn to have self-compassion because they can't even begin to have self-compassion for their partner or their spouse if they can't have it for themselves. So that can feel very counterintuitive, reaching out to somebody when you feel so unlovable or so unworthy that can feel counterintuitive and telling your story to other people, to safe people can feel very counterintuitive. Absolutely. Okay, so let's go back to the same scenario. Okay, so walking through there, Alana says her piece about it. Um, you can't have, um, I think I remember you saying, Alana, um, you know, you've taken so much from me. And, I, and what I do is, is, again, I'm going to have, I'm gonna experience shame. And it is not becoming, it is not about becoming shame proof, okay? Is about becoming shame resilient. Uh, and I recognized in the moment that I want to distance myself from her. I found myself, all of a sudden she changes from that warm fuzzy person to that prickly pear, prickly cactus. And I go, and I go, that is something I recognize, that's something I know. And this is not gonna be useful in my relationship with this woman that I love a lot, okay? And I don't want to do this. And Somebody gave me the permission a long time ago that I get a chance to be neutral right now in this experience, which is I get to go um, be connected to her, but be somewhat out of body for a moment. And what this is what it sounds like for me is I get really, really curious and I get really, really defensive of her. I get really, really curious and I get really, really defensive. And I go and I, and I say, yeah, that totally makes sense that you have had so much taken from you. And then there's another one. There's rodeos. Counterintuitive, right? Like men, but just think about it for a second. Counterintuitive for me to validate my wife in that moment. But that is not cool that you've had that taken from you. It is not okay that I took that from you. It is not okay that you are on date night and all of a sudden out of the middle of nowhere, you get reminded of all the things that I've done. And by the way, you want to be really impactful, list the things that you've done, like actually speak them, do not beat around the bush, talk about what she's talking about, which is if I'm going to speak to Alana, yeah, that you want to go to a, a rodeo, but if you did, you would be worried about every little person that would be walking past you and, um, and the fact that I have objectified and I have lusted over those kind of people. And, I, and then I get a chance to own my truth, uh, but I'm not going to do that yet, okay, in this moment. I'm going to be what we call neutral, which is the curious of, which is the, um, you know, what do you, what do you need from me? Like, what, what, what can I do? Um, what is this like? Uh, now, remember, I'm talking about things that might take from walking through this building to the car, to the way home, but it's about me staying engaged. It's about me talking. One of the things that I'll do, just a strategy for me, and may or may not work for you, is as I go silent and I think inside of my brain, okay, I think of here, because I'm afraid of saying things, something that will make the situation worse. What will make the situation worse is for me to stay in my brain, okay? I get a chance to share with her what's going through my head, which is I want to, I, I, I don't want to make this worse. 
but I do want to connect. You know, I do. I I'm I want to be quiet right now. I want to be silent. But I, this is about you. This is I don't want to. I want this to be about you and not about me. Okay. There is, a, there is a question in the chat. It said, "Do you agree with her?" Like, yes, I did mess up your life, and I. Here's the thing with that. That that's that's a really sticky question. Because it's a good question, but it's really sticky because for a long time. Luke in the beginning would try to empathize, but it would become a pity party for him. It would become a woe is me session. And so in the beginning, it was like, oh yeah, I did mess up your life. I'm such a effing mess up. Like I screwed everything up. And then it was all about him and his pain and what he did wrong and how this was so hard and so bad. And so now no longer is, are we like making space for the trigger that came up in the pain for me? It was all about him. And so him saying, yes, I really did hurt you. And I see how that's impacting you right now. My choices make it so you're scared that you can't go to the rodeo, like staying with me in my pain that was really helpful. But if he goes, yes, I did mess up your life. Yes. I'm a piece of crap. And then that shame spiral, he starts going down that and that's if, not helpful. And if I go down the shame spiral of, oh my gosh, I did screw up your life. This is, I mean, geez, oh, I can't be with you. I can't stay present with you. But if I go like, the, I don't even know how hard this is, but this does look really hard for you. Um, I, this makes, you know, the fact that you're having this type of response, that how difficult is this? What does this look like for you? And, you know, there's a part of me, I have it. And thank you for putting that in the chat. Thank you for putting in that chat. Because if Alana in her all the wisdom didn't, didn't jump in there with that, do you agree with her? Um, like, yes, I did mess up your life. The truth is, yeah, for sure. She's living in a place now where she has to be completely, she's, being tortured, being in public, and especially in those types of events. So I changed the way she had to, she was viewing her life. So I'll take accountability for that. But a lot of point, you pointed out so well how I go about that accountability. Well, and what's really interesting. So this, this piece of like getting curious, like you have to get curious and lean into her pain to really start creating that empathy but if you're already, like, if you, I feel like we kind of jumped a little bit into like, here's the healthy conversations and here's what this looks like. But the reality is, is when you, your own, uh, your own shame gets triggered and your self judgment starts kicking in often, especially in the beginning, there is a period of needing to, to do your own shame work. And so in the beginning for Luke, it sounded more like, okay, uh, uh, I'm getting super triggered myself with lots of shame. I need a minute. And then during that time that he took apart, which could have been a few minutes or a day, that's where he really was. Okay. Recognizing the shame trigger, reaching out to his support people, reaching out to his sponsor or guys from his group or meeting with his therapist to share the story, check where he was at, notice what was coming up before he could come back to me and re-engage and do this type of work. So we kind of, we kind of jumped straight into like, here's, here's like best case scenario, what it sounds like, but there was, there was a, a long period of this, him, not just abandoning me, but him going, oh, okay, I'm having a lot of defenses and stuff coming up. And I want to, I want to be present with you, but I can't right now. I got to go work this through so I can come back and show up for you. Yeah. There, I'll, I want to share some of the middle too. We used to attend a, an ARP group on Saturday nights that were, they, it, it developed a theme of couples. It was a general addiction meeting, a uh, 12 step meeting on Saturday night, you know, date night. Uh, and it was large. There was like 35, 40 people in this and couples would come. That was kind of, there was quite a few couples. And I learned this process in that meeting because somehow it was safe to share um, the stuff that Alon talked about, which was 
uh, learning my shame, learning what it was, sharing my story about what happened, and speaking to that shame in that group setting where Alana was actually sitting next to me and I could actually show up. Now I did that a lot of times with other men, but it, it was, it was very therapeutic and very healing to be able to share what was going on inside of my brain um, with a safe group of people. And then she was also there to be able to hear it too. That might've been a side tangent, Alana. So um, where from here, Alana? Um, well, I just, I, I guess as we kind of like wrap up this conversation on shame, um, and if you have questions specifically on shame, please put them in, in the chat. Um, but a couple of things I just want to highlight is a lot of times we're not in touch or in tune with our shame. And very often our shame is rooted deep, deep, deep in childhood. It began and it's been fed throughout a lifetime. And so just recognizing that we all have shame and we may not recognize how it shows up. Like I remember in reading one of Brene's books, she talked about perfectionism and how perfectionism is rooted in shame. And the way she described that, I was like, oh crap, that's so me. Like I have to have the perfect house or I'm supposed to show up in this way. And it was the shame of like, in this embarrassment, if I didn't show up in a certain way, would I still be accepted? What would people think? And so learning about shame and figuring out how it shows up to you for you is really important. But the antidote to shame is empathy. And that begins with empathy for ourselves. And it may not be empathy for our choices, but empathy for us as a human being. We have to learn how to give that to ourselves and have that self-compassion and have that love for ourselves so that we can then later be able to give that to other people. And when I'm working with men, I mean, that piece right there, that piece on learning to have self-compassion, a lot of times wives are like, what are you, what are you doing? Because in the beginning, I didn't want Luke to have any compassion. I wanted him to feel every ounce of pain for what he did. Cause I wanted him to feel as bad as I did. And the reality is, is he can still have all of that pain while practicing self-compassion. And that's essential for him to learn to have that self-compassion for who he is at his core. And some of that sometimes is going back and learning how to love that little boy or that teenager or these different parts of you that you may look back and not like that guy. This type of work is so, so, so essential. And I, I just, I challenge you to, um, to tackle it head on. Yeah. And it's okay that um, that is frustrating. Um, for, um, so guys, I'm thinking about you and the work that I do with you one-on-one -on -one or in groups around having self-compassion and how difficult it is to learn to have self-compassion. But until you learn it, you can't really deal with your shame, just like you talk about Alana. So I can think of one man in particular. I often just want to jump in the quicksand and push him out of it and go like, dude, you're, you're a good guy. Like, you're a good guy. And I recognize there's nothing that I can do to do that. But he has to learn that and, and learn to have self-compassion for himself. Um, well, and, and I might trigger everybody by saying this, the women or those who have been betrayed. Um, but I remember... Uh, our therapist at the time, he said, Luke, you are not your choices. And I was like, what the hell? He is his choices. Like, don't tell him that. Don't give him a free pass. I was so upset. And I was so like defensive around this because my brain went, if he doesn't feel like he's his choices, then he'll do his choices again. And I'll be hurt again. And then, and then here I go through all of the pain, but that piece of differentiating he is not his choices. Yes, he made those choices, but he at his core is not his choices. And I'll give the example, like if you have a little newborn baby and I hold it and I said, okay, does this little baby have worth and value? I yet have met some, haven't met somebody who says like, yeah, the baby has worth and value. Okay. Well, this, the sweet little baby, when, when do they lose their worth and value? 
Like, is it when they start having tantrums? Is it when they start doing this? Like, no, the, the worth and value of this human comes in, intact. Like, did they start getting value because they could talk? No, they came with it. Like you yourself have worth and value. You are not your choices. Sometimes your choices block you from being able to see and feel your value, but it's there. And we have to learn how to differentiate those. We got a couple of questions in the chat a lot. Yeah. Um, how do men feel empowered in their relationship and in the in this instead of just feeling like they lose themselves or everything is about the life? Okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to YouTube and look up a video by Dr. Jake Porter called Stay on the Coaster. He's not talking about a roller coaster. He does an analogy of a little like a drink coaster. But in that video, it's like a five minute video. He goes in and he talks about how there is this, this differentiation of power, because when we have had this secrecy and those lies and the manipulation in the relationship already, there was an, this imbalance of power. And so for the relationship to get back to where it was, we can't just have her come like here there is a season where the power shifts, where it really does feel like it's out of balance. But what we are doing is we are creating safety for her. We are addressing the trauma. We're letting her know it's safe again. So it does this for a season. And then as she starts to feel safer, then it will balance out. So YouTube, Dr. Jake Porter, stay on the coaster. And then also on, um, on the podcast that Amy and I do, it's called Choose to Be. There's an episode called Road to Recovery. I believe that's what the episode is called that Luke came on. You might want to put some this. of this stuff in the chat, Alana. What's that? Like the coaster stuff. You want to throw that in the chat so people can find it? Yes, I will throw in the chat if you will do the next question. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, the, I love the, and just to comment, on, just, just to build on that, Alana. When somebody told me neutrality is what I'm looking for, to stay neutral in my experience um, with my wife and to be curious and to and be able to hold space for her like she's talking about somebody else, that was very helpful to me in the beginning as I learned to work through my shame. Okay, uh, what might a shame spiral look like if someone goes into fight mode? Great question, great question. So I think of crazy making and gaslighting, okay? Um, if you don't know what those are, just kind of look them up. Um, uh, but I think gaslighting is, and they start to make it about you. They start to like, you know, if I would have gaslit in the, in that conversation with Alana around the rodeo stuff, which is, I mean, geez, we're like eight or nine months into recovery and I haven't lost the battle yet. Like, you know, I don't know how long this is going to take before you can, we can go into a, where we can go to like life is back as normal. Um, you know, this is so intense. The fact that you are responding to every little thing out there. Uh, it's not like I lost a battle or something, or have you not seen all the good things that I've done lately? Uh, just more of that, making it about her, but not in an empathetic way, putting, turn around and putting it on her. This person here is that I would like to add that you're not your choices and you are not what has happened to you. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so does shame trigger my husband's flight fight or freeze? It feels like it's his old addiction behaviors. Uh, Can I answer yeah. that? One? Go ahead. Um, the answer is it. Yes, it certainly can. Um, and those old patterns when we have done the same pattern over and over and over again, those neuro pathways are really, really strong. And so when you're trying to rewire the brain, the best way that it's not going to feel like the old pattern is by calling out the old pattern and then voicing how you're trying to do it different. So if like you find yourself going into fight, you find yourself going into freeze or flight, then you go, okay, hold on. 
this is what's happening. I'm going here. That right there, like just voicing that you're already starting to break the pattern. But when those neural pathways are so strong, it's going to take a while to build the new neural pathways and for those to become strong. So however we can start breaking the pattern and make it explicit, the better. Absolutely. Well said. Okay. I think that's the, I think that's the question, Vilana. We had one more in the Q and A. Did you see that one? It says, what do you do when your spouse is looking for you to provide the compassion he needs? How do you not take the responsibility for his work? Um, Well, I'll just say our pattern for a lot of years was me to take on the responsibility for his work. I grew up in a family that where that's what you did. And um, so I first had to recognize how to step out of those patterns myself and to recognize when I was getting triggered and when I wanted to pull into those patterns and then I had to voice of, okay, I, I like, I want to help you with this, but this is actually yours. So my, when I was in a good place, it sounded something along the lines of, I love you. And I see you're struggling with this and I'm going to give you room to work that out. But when you're ready, I'm here. That was when I was in a good place. Sometimes it was, um, very raw and there was a lot of um my own pain coming at him with full force for sure just scanning the chat we we did have two questions come in ahead of time do we want to tackle those with a quick yeah uh, with, Dear yeah, Abby, let's, answer a quick let's, one. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. okay. Um, I'll get the. We recognize we're going to run a few minutes over, guys. So totally appreciate if you make plans for an hour. But we're going to go a few minutes over. Uh, let's see. So. Do you want me to read it? Uh, yeah, I'm going to hit. If you wouldn't mind tackling the first one, number 22, that would be good. Okay. Um, extended family relationships during trauma recovery and how to establish new healthy couple friendships. Um, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to give something fast on this. Um, in the beginning, we have a, a lot of times I see individuals try to tackle it all at once and there, I want to say there's no race to healing. I want to, and there to be a race as fast as I could because I didn't want to be in pain and I wanted every area of my life to heal as fast as it could. But a lot of times, um, saving extended family relationships until you have extra capacity can be really beneficial because you only have so much emotional energy at any given time to give. So depending on where you are at with your own trauma, I'm speaking to the betrayed partner first, where you're at with your own trauma, um, letting your focus be your healing and creating that incubator around you while you heal can be really beneficial and slower is faster. If you're willing to slow it down, protect your energy, protect where you're spending your time healing and really solidify your own healing. So you have more to give to others later can be really beneficial. So saving those extended family relationships until you have more to give, which might mean, um, depending Um, it it might mean, um, having a season of just higher boundaries until you're ready to tackle that. And I'm going back to the podcast, Amy and I have an episode on extended family that, that could be beneficial. Um, and then establish new healthy couple friendships really comes down to, can the two of you as a couple learn what healthy looks like and what it feels like. And then you start building those relationships with other people when you know healthy and you live healthy and you experience healthy, you're more likely to attract other healthy friendships and healthy couples around you. Cool. Um, The other one was dealing with wife's anger following full disclosure, how the addict can properly reduce exposure to triggers for both of them. Um, And are amends and restitution even possible following betrayal? Let's start with the last one first. They are absolutely possible following betrayal. 
I am a huge fan of when appropriate full disclosures, because we've talked about shame today. All what, I mean, geez, what full disclosures do is they confront shame head on. And usually a man is dizzy with shame through the experience. And it is beautiful to watch him be dizzy through his shame to become out in the end to realize he separate himself from his choices and who he actually is. So totally dig watching that experience and recognize that it is so traumatizing for what his wife and looks like it almost kills him. Um, uh, how, how we can proactively reduce exposure to triggers for both of them. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not, when you talk about emotional triggers, I'm not trying to reduce the emotional triggers that you're getting from, and I'm kind of leaning into those emotional triggers. I'm finding out what those mean for me. Um, you know, I, you know, you got the triggers that exist in life around addiction, the sexual ones, but when it comes to a full disclosure, um, you know, when that man's, I recognize there's some things that he needs to do, like really, really good self-care, um, connection with other men, but really it's looking at those triggers deeply and processing through them and doing everything we talked about today as far as sharing what they are, um, which is, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the muscles breaking down and and growing even larger than they were before. Alana, you want to comment on that? Um, I do. I was trying to find a quote, but I can't find it in time. But there is this, this quote that basically says, healing is not the absence of triggers. That's not, or avoiding triggers. That's not healing. Healing is, is when you have the trigger, you use the tools and are able to work through the trigger. That's what healing is. Same thing with shame, right? We're not trying to avoid things that cause shame though. Like I just totally validate. We don't want to be triggered. Nobody wants to be triggered. And if we can do certain things to um, reduce triggers, like by all means, let's reduce triggers. But the goal isn't to be trigger free or to avoid every situation that could be potentially triggering. It's learning how to work through the triggers that we really become empowered and that allows us to feel like we can engage and go through life again. I mean, just have to speak about the last man that I took through a full disclosure. It was so beautiful, everybody. I mean, this man loathed himself and hated himself prior. And he's like, why in the world am I be doing a full disclosure? I'm going to kill my marriage. My wife is going to leave me, you know, and I'm, um, you know, I'm sitting there going like, okay, well, tell me what's, tell me what you have to share with her that she hasn't already heard before. He had a few things. But I could also, my sense was, is that it was going to be very difficult for her. But what he was scared of was the actual feelings of dealing and looking at his behavior and going and, and think, and he just built a life around not looking at that. So what I teach men to do in Choose 180 is I go, all right, I want you to take that trigger and the feelings that come from that trigger. And I want you to take them and I want you to hold them in your hand. Like if you're feeling fear, I want you to look at that fear and I want you to hold it and, and, and just visualize what does fear look like? What is that? Where's it showing up in my body and giving that space, those emotions that follow a trigger is very, very powerful and whole other subject with itself, but even sexual triggers, it's about not throwing them off to the side and pretending like they're the enemy, but actually processing where are my sexual triggers come from. So Holy macro, I could, we could do another hour and a half with that. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, and there, there's a question that says, can you describe in detail what it really means to lean into the triggers? And so the triggers that we were referring to um, in the beginning, at least in my head, were leaning into her triggers, which is get curious, let the discomfort be there, hear more about her pain instead of trying to fix her pain or manage her pain. That's the leaning into it as you're capable. And a lot of times, if you nail this process, when you're with your spouse, when I'm with Alana and I ask the right questions, she seems to be more emotionally volatile. Okay. She seems to even be even stronger with her emotions. And that doesn't mean that I'm doing it wrong. Okay. Her emoting even more when I ask the right questions, like, what is this like for you? Is this right on? Um, is actually something that I'm allowing her to feel and creating space for in that pain. And it's really good. Well, yeah, usually there's this heightened emotion at first. And then as that is really heard and validated, that's where then that, um, that, that comes in and, and eases. Um, okay. So one other question that came in 
Luke, it said, what pushed you to decide to change when others lose their family and continue to choose their behavior? Um, By the way, it wasn't me. Like, I just want to make that really clear because I will have women ask. They'll say, Alana, what did you do? Like, what did you have that got him to change? And the reality is nothing. This piece, however you answer, Luke, I don't know how you're going to answer, but it, it wasn't me. It had nothing to do with me. I don't know. I think it was just, I mean, I got so many lies, so many ugly. I mean, my story is ugly. We just had the, the YouTube video get released on it or a video get released on our story. And, um, you know, and, and watching it, I just I hid for so long. I got so tired of it. And I took that opportunity to escape um, back in 2014 and, and just really started to build up these tools to learn who I was. And I started liking the guy that I hated and loathed so much. Like, I really like me a lot. Like, I'm a good dude. Like, I am a, I'm, a, I'm a worthy person of love and acceptance. And I learned that I didn't need to be perfect to be worthy of love and acceptance. And it just created something that I didn't really want to go back to that old life. Oh, here's a dildo. I'm not going to paint a picture that's not real. I still have triggers. I still have to recognize my sexual responses. Alana still gets triggered. I still have to show up at those, but I've learned to value me and that and and this film developed some brilliance around that. And that was like, I love this analogy. It was like the sun coming up, you know, learning to choose my family and choose my sobriety and that stuff. It took a long time. It took a, a long time to get there. So um, there wasn't one like culminating moment like movies probably describe. So hopefully that was helpful in there. Um, question came in. It said back to the family question. What if we planned a family reunion? Oh, trigger. We agreed, <laughs> we agreed to it last year before all of us. It's next month. Otherwise we have avoided family. Canceling the reunion will cause a lot of attention and most people don't know what's going on. Do we just set boundaries? Um, well, I'll just tell you, A, I can't tell you what to do. <laughs> like I can't give you advice per se. But what I can say is there are multiple scenarios that you could possibly choose. You could choose to step away and give yourself more time. You could choose to go. And if you choose to go, I would highly suggest having a plan in place of how to be prepared for the triggers when they come. Not if they come, but when they come. Do we have a way to leave at any moment? Do we have a way to check in with each other? Do we emotionally feel safe enough with each other as a partnership that if one of us gets triggered, we can, we can pull away and go regroup? Are we in a place that we can do regular check-ins so we can stay connected with each other throughout because that can help? Are we going off with the family where we're totally isolated and once you're there, you're there? Um, do we have family dynamics where the, the whole family environment is very enmeshed and people are going to be asking lots of questions? Do we have more of an environment where we can have alone time or like just kind of weighing out all of these pieces and then based off of your capacity level now, where you are as a couple, where you are as, as individuals, the question I ask is not what do you want, but what would be most wise? What would be most wise for each of you as individuals? What would be most wise for you as a couple? And then make your decision off of what is most wise. Because a lot of times what's most wise is going to come with some level of discomfort. And I don't know with your own situation or story what that looks like, but I just have lots and lots of empathy. Whether you don't go or you do go, it's, there's no easy answer. Hey, Alana, help me with this in a little bit, but um, speaking to the women, um, don't do stuff just to protect him. Okay? So if you're doing stuff to protect him, to the other family, to save his reputation, you know, to show up with, to put a pretty face on and, and, and act like everything's okay, um, that self-sacrifice, um, you know, if you choose to do that and you're being aware of what you're doing, then okay. And this is why I ask Alana to help a little bit. It's just, you know, you don't have to self-sacrifice for other people. A um, uh, great gift that Alana gave me right away was, was not protecting me from having people see my story. She didn't put it, 
she didn't put an ad out in the newspaper, right? But she didn't pretend that everything was cool. So, and I hated that. Yeah. And when, when you know, the term sacrifice, um, when we sacrifice for somebody, like a lot of times we are taught through a religious lens that sacrificing is a very beautiful thing and it absolutely can be. But when we self-sacrifice, we're sacrificing parts of ourselves for other people and we are hurting ourselves or we are losing ourselves in the process, that becomes problematic. And when it becomes a pattern of always self-sacrificing, that becomes really problematic. So I remember again, like one time my therapist was like, Alana, stop taking one for the team. You're actually hurting yourself and your family because you always are taking one for the team. And so you know, this is us. This is our, our story. I'm not saying it's yours, but I took self-sacrifice to the extreme. I took sacrifice to the extreme of losing myself. And that was part of my work in recovery was learning that it was okay that other people had discomfort because I took care of myself. And that still was does. really hard. She still does too, guys. Like she's, um, this weekend we got a reunion. Again, it's the season of reunions. Um, and she's not, you know, she's not going to go because she recognizes that there's, um, she needs to mental health, like staying away. Sometimes family is difficult, but not necessarily. I'm scrolling through to see if we got any family on this recording. Um, <laughs> no. doesn't look like we do. Uh, no. Well, no, and my going this weekend is um, I'm coming off of the retreat and we are doing a massive home remodel. And for my own mental health, I will serve my family much better if I take the weekend and recoup, re recoup, recoup and regroup while Luke takes the kids to the reunion. Yeah. And other times I go and a hundred percent jumping into it. But and I think, I think this is the last one, but the, there was one that was asked, how was that a gift Luke? Um, on the part of Alana not sharing that with her, not hiding everything. That was a gift because I was a hider. Like I was, oh my goodness, that mask. I was good at wearing it. I showed people what they wanted to see. I could be what you wanted me to be. I would observe you. I would watch you and I would learn what you wanted. And I would be that person. And when my ugly got shared, I had to come out from the mask. And, um, and I wanted to that in a really, I believe, respectful way, but also wasn't going to make it soft and warm for me, to, uh, just not tell anybody. Uh, and that was a gift for me to just have to deal with, um, yeah, deal with my experience and let people know. And that was the number one thing that I'd share with people. And they would be like, me too, or I get it. Or, and then some people were like, I'm, I'm, you're, you're a bad dude, you know? So I got to deal with all of it. I mean, it was helpful. Well, in AA, they talk about you are as sick as your secrets and a family is as sick as their secrets. And I didn't, I was tired of having a sick family. And so I didn't go air Luke's story, but I also didn't hide my own experiences and my own story. And each of us had our own story to share. And so I found safe people that I could share with. And that was really essential in my healing. Yeah. Uh, Alana, how would you answer that one? How do you have it be open versus airing dirty laundry? Yes. So really good question. Um, airing dirty laundry is me throwing him under the bus. It's me finding people to validate me to say how bad he is. Me trying to find a way so he can hurt like I was hurting. That comes from a place of, of my own pain and toxicity. That's not helpful. That um, I did very rarely, but the couple of times that I found myself doing it, I felt worse. I never felt better and, um, and wasn't helpful to me or him. What was helpful was me really learning who was safe, um, learning how to ask myself, why do I want to share this with who I want to share this? What am I hoping to gain? What is the purpose of this? And me finding those safe people like a support group, like a therapist, like certain family members, I didn't go tell this to all my family members, but finding all of those um, was really essential in my own healing. But I had to do work to figure out who to share and how to share. So good question. And I'm realizing, Luke, we are like 20 minutes over um, and you've hung with us this long. I'm 
thank you to everyone who's hung with us. I, I hope it was beneficial. Um, sometimes I feel like when we do this, we might give you more questions than when you've started with. So if you do have questions, please reach out. Um, let us know. We can save them for next month. We do this once a month. We do this because it was so helpful for Luke and I to hear together the same information and then we could go talk about it and to have like this listening together. So hopefully we're offering you something similar. Do um, you wanna add anything to wrap up Luke? No, thank you for your kind words. You guys are always so kind in our, in our sharing our experience. So um, it's good to hang out with you even though we only see your names and we, we hear your voices and your chat messages. So uh, it's really good to hang out with you tonight but I don't think I have anything else. Okay, thank you all. And we will see you here again next, next month. I will put a shameless plug um, for you, Luke. Uh, Luke does run men's groups. I love when I have an individual client who's working with Luke in one of his men's groups because there are so many tools. Luke doesn't know I'm just gonna say all this, but there are so many tools that they get around emotional resiliency and around the shame resiliency and that EQ, that emotional intelligence that are really part of recovery that I want all men to have. So I don't even know if you have room in your groups, Luke, but I will shamelessly plug it because I love when I have men who are doing those because it, it makes a difference. So. Awesome. Well, thank you, Alana. And it was good to, a good hang out with you all tonight. Have a nice Memorial Day weekend and or Labor Day weekend, and we will catch y'all later. Good night.